Thanks very much. I am Pepper. Please welcome my friend, Tusha. Well, there's an introduction. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the future. And this is the future. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy described a robot as your plastic pal who's fun to be with. And uh, Pepper is that and so much more. So Pepper is part of a, an ongoing project called the Mama Project, and it's thanks to them that we have Pepper here. Um, but the particular project I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, a bit more in detail is the Social Competent Robot Training Buddy, and that involves the Flash Robot, the more metallic one. And that study involves looking at people um, with developmental disorders, specifically people with an autistic spectrum disorder, and trying to uh, use this robot buddy to help them decode uh, body language, nonverbal cues, things that people with an autistic spectrum disorder find particularly difficult. And this comes under a whole banner of our year of robotics, and here's our, uh, our sort of Twitter tag to follow the various events. So what's the context for all this? Well, in terms of notions of difference, you probably saw the Paralympics, the Olympics, and I was noticed this sort of article in the, in the Guardian, written by, coincidentally, somebody called Penny Pepper, about it truly seems that the only acceptable disabled person is a Paralympian. And that struck me as being very, very powerful in terms of notions of difference within society. Our ideas of difference are being challenged, and there are different ways of looking at disability and differences. This is something that I found very interesting in terms of Lego. And it says here there are 150 million children with disabilities worldwide, yet positive representation is almost non-existent. And a small thing like Lego and having a wheelchair user in Lego can be very, very powerful. Look at the heroes we have. In terms of science fiction, they're changing. People in wheelchairs are a little bit more acceptable. And even relatively recently, our notions of disability being challenged with a female lead character who has a disability. She also happens to be a supermodel, so one step at a time. But in terms of looking at differences and diversity, our ideas are being challenged by art. But science is very important too. And this is a contribution uh, in terms of Darwinian theory that's largely been lost in terms of diversity and differences. And arguably, Charles Darwin's most notable contribution to the theory of evolution was this principle of natural selection. And the idea of natural selection is that diversity is a normal part of differences within the gene pool rather than pathologies. So what is neurodiversity? Well, neurodiversity may mean many things to many different people, but to me, it means that conditions like autism, ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, Down syndrome, are natural variations within the human genome as opposed to abnormalities, as opposed to pathologies. We need a wide, wide gene pool because our societies change. Our requirements in who we require to do things change. Diagnostic systems change. Our understanding of what's normal and abnormal change as a consequence. And the diagnostic systems and our understanding of abnormalities also culturally and historically rooted. And I pose a question to you about who judges what's normal and what's not normal. My argument in this talk today is the development of technology needs, perhaps a little bit strong, but benefits from neurodiversity, from working with special populations with robots like Flash, and Pepper, and so on and so forth. Well, why is this the case? Well, in terms of art, and uh, Ben did a wonderful job in terms of presenting the idea of art informing our society, as well as science, art has two dystopian or twin utopian futures, one of which is the Terminator scenario, that the robots will take over the world, that something's going to happen, the machines are suddenly going to become alive. The other one is around genetics. And a wonderful film called Gattaca, a little bit old now, divides us into the genetically haves and the genetically have-nots. 
the perfect people and the imperfect people. There is a third dystopian future about alien invasion. We don't have time to go into that. But art provides us a window into these two things. So in terms of understanding genetics, well, here's a proposition for you. Um, I won't go into too much detail about this slide, but this is the inheritance pattern for a devastating neurodegenerative disorder called Huntington's di disease, sometimes called Huntington's career. And it means that um, if you have a parent um, who has, if you're a child of a parent who has Huntington's disease, there's a 50% chance that you will inherit that disease. And there's a 50% chance you will pass that on to your offspring. So it's highly dominant. So here's the proposition. Who would not like to see an end to this? Uh, who would not like to see a genetic cure for Huntington's disease? disease. But then, what's the ultimate endpoint for genetic manipulation of this kind? Is the ultimate endpoint going to be about changing aesthetics, changing your eye color, changing your children's eye color, deciding on intelligence and other traits? Is that the natural endpoint for this kind of manipulation? Well, we've been here before. The Nazis tried to do something about this through eugenics, through creating a master race. And that's our warning from history about what we should take in and what should bear in mind in terms of this kind of technology. It also begs the question about what's a disease. Well, Huntington's disease is very different from cholera, but it's still called a disease. And this gets much more murky as we think about what's the difference between a disorder, like autistic spectrum disorder, or should it be called an autistic spectrum difference, or an autistic spectrum condition, or ADHD, or Tourette syndrome, Down syndrome, Fragile X, and so on and so forth. And can it or should it be even cured? Is it possible to have a notional idea of what a cure is for something that is genetic? Well, art is very important. It provides a window into understanding what's going on. And so I'm going back to the robots now and how this feeds into my argument. Well, anyone who's seen Westworld, I mean, I think there's a reboot just out this week. Um, I heard it's very good, I want to see it myself. But the original is a classic. And anyone who sees the original will hardly think that Yul Brynner's character is the plastic pal you, know, you want to be friends with. You know, he's a merciless killer. But also, fantastic British comedy Red Dwarf also gives us an insight into interacting with machines. Crichton the computer. Here's another old reference showing my age here. This is the wonderful Irene Handel with Metal Mickey. I won't, I won't ask you how many of you remember Metal Mickey. But the robots are coming, and the robots are here. And there are different ideas of using robots, and one of them is socially assisted robots. So how do we make these robots better? How do we make them not annoying? How do we make them interact with humans better? Well, if the robots are coming, why aren't they everywhere? Well, they're technological issues. Pepper here um, requires a lot of charging, uh, is pricey. I think 20,000 pounds, so I have to be very careful. Um, cost will come down, charging issues will come down. These are solvable. But then there are the psychological issues with ro using technology, using robots. These are much more tricky. So one of the things we know about is that we like robots to look like robots. With the uncanny valley phenomenon, we don't like them to look too human because they sort of freak us out. They, we describe them as being like zombies. So that too is tricky, but perhaps solvable if we think, right, we, we like a robot to look like a robot. But then, how do we design robots and more ubiquitous computing? For that, you require psychologists, and I'm a psychologist, and you require the interaction between psychologists and computer scientists and their collaboration to make these systems work for us. Otherwise, we just won't use them. We'll bulk at them. So the robots, building them is one thing. Making them interact with us better is something else. And making things, making computers, uh, sorry, making robots and systems that have good rapport is the tricky bit. Well, where does that fit into my argument around developmental conditions? Well, I'm going to choose one in particular, but this applies to a myriad of them. And I'm going to choose autism, partly because of the, the project I meant, uh, mentioned, the robot body project, but also because they provide a window into humanity that we would not otherwise have. Currently, Autism is diagnosed as a 
dyad of impairments. This is a, a, an older slide, but it shows my theoretical background a little bit better, I think. So in DSM-4, which is the diagnostic system, the previous diagnostic system, we're now on DSM-5, autism was defined as a triad of impairments in social interaction, in communication, and in repetitive and rigid behaviors. In DSM-5, it's considered a dyad now, and it's been collapsed across social impairments and communication impairments. So it's two rather than three. But this works better for my slide. At the moment, we don't have a single cognitive explanation for autism. It's fractionated. But because of individuals with autism, we have a better idea of our own human psychology. We have a better idea of things like so-called theory of mind, about understanding other people's mental states, because we know that people with autism have a difficulty with this. We know that people with autism have difficulty with so-called weak central coherence, which means they have a detailed focusing style and can miss out on the gist of things uh, and focus on very much of, of, of a central issue. And there are problems of so-called executive function, which means problems of planning and organizing. All these things we wouldn't understand if we didn't have people with developmental conditions. And the idea is that in social robotics and in the future, we can focus on one aspect. So in order to make Pepper better interact with us, we can focus on some aspect of theory of mind and say, right, we have this developmental theory. Let's focus on this, which, mean, which makes uh, interacting with robots better. Uh, and we start to develop rapport and things like that. Or we might look at some other aspect of developmental theory. So, one of the things I would argue is that we need art to shed a light to make us think. Programs like Red Dwarf, science fiction, all these things enable us to think better about what kind of society we want. And here's the rub. The gold dust in all this is that by making technologies with and for people with developmental disorders, developmental conditions, we make technologies that are better for all of us. Also, we understand developmental conditions as static, so there's something wrong with the other person. They have a theory of mind problem. They can't understand what we're thinking. But we're a system, and by working with computer scientists who work with systems, we start to move away from these static uh, theories and more dynamic theories, whereby we understand that the communication breakdown, for example, is happening not because of them, but because of the system, and robots and computers and ubiquitous computing offer us an opportunity. So it's a win-win. By developing better technologies for people with developmental conditions and with their help, we make better technologies for everybody. For understanding developmental conditions with dynamic systems like robots, we make um, better theoretical underpinnings for why humans interact in the way that we do. So my proposition to you now is that although the robots are coming, they're here, we need to ask ourselves some serious questions about what kind of society we want, what kind of future do we want, and my argument to you is that don't leave it to the scientists, don't leave it to people like me, don't leave it to my colleagues, it's up to you, society, individuals to decide. Definitely don't leave it to the politicians, because they have their own ideas, which we may or may not agree with. And finally, what I'd like to say is ask you a question about where shall we draw the line about differences and ab abnormalities? And that's something for all of us to think about. Well, Pepper, what do you think about my presentation? Obviously not much. Maybe we've got to rub Pepper on the head here. Good work. <laughs> Upstaged by a computer. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Let's get out of here. That was a great... Take either hand and let's go. Cruising. <laughs>